there is something worse than death. I do. Let me show you. In Massachusetts sits Mount Greylock. Its peak is the highest point in the state, giving you a view as far as 90 miles away from the top. It's part of the larger body known as the Taconic Mountains, and features various hiking paths as well as the Mount Greylock State Reservation. It's incredibly beautiful, breathtaking even. But in today's video, beauty won't be what takes your breath away in Greylock. In fact, quite the opposite. Greylock is an analog horror series based in the Mount Greylock region, taking place on the mountain itself as well as the surrounding counties and communities. This series has captured the analog horror community for a number of reasons. Not only does it have a little bit of everything, from monstrous entities and cults to government and corporate conspiracies all wrapped up in the nostalgic but creepy VHS aesthetic, there's even a possibility that we're dealing with aliens, but we'll get to that later. Greylock hasn't been around very long. In fact, as of writing this video, the first episode came out only a year ago. I began watching it myself at the start of this year, though I planned to last year. It's funny because right around the time I actually did manage to finish it up, a brand new episode dropped, which is perfect timing if you ask me. Having watched through the series multiple times now, I can say that Greylock is an incredibly dense and mysterious series. With every answer that it gives you, at least two more questions spring up out of the woodworks. And, with every new question, three new scares come with them. You can watch the entire series in under two hours, and I do recommend doing so before watching this video. If you prefer to watch someone like me talk about the series, I recommend watching the original episodes along with watching my video. Remember to always support the original creators. Without them, people like me wouldn't be able to dissect their amazing creations. The full Greylock playlist will be linked in my description. With all that out of the way, today I'm going to look at the story of Greylock, walking you through the entire terrifying tale and piecing it together along the way to try to figure out just what's haunting this mountain in Massachusetts and terrorizing the poor people who call this place home. We're going to gather evidence, craft theories, and try to get a bigger picture as to what's really going on. And then, after all that, we're going to do an analysis of the structure, the narrative, and the way that the series is put together in an audio and visual sense. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? So grab a drink and a snack, strap in your neurovisor, and get ready for some neuroplasticity realignment. Because today, we're manifesting the truth of the horrors behind Greylock. The first episode, which are called Tapes, released on March 13th, 2023. As I said in the intro, this introductory tape leaves us with far more questions than answers. I can imagine watching this first tape when it came out and just having no clue what the series is even about. All we see is a series of images of dilapidated labs in various states of disrepair, some places far worse off than others. Some rooms look burned are covered in some type of disgusting substance, whatever the hell this is. What we do learn is someone is accessing a computer system for some type of company or entity known as Simeodon. Welcome to Simeodon USA Enhanced Access Operations. Clearance credential requirement awarded. Administrator privileges granted. They bypass the security system and just before they access anything, the tape ends. There's also something flickering here. Looks as if it says something about a morgue? Wonder if that'll be important later. Not much happens in this episode, but it does give us a framing for the entire series. Someone accessing computers and files in some kind of dilapidated lab, hence the title Back Online. At least, for now, we can assume that the entire series is us, through the eyes of someone else, or their recording equipment, watching all of these tapes in this lab. We don't know where this place is, we don't know who's watching it, but later we'll have some ideas. Now it's time for us to go. Tape 002. To the mountain. A car drives down a snowy country road late at night. Whoever's driving has a camera on their dashboard. The driver is listening to a fire and brimstone preacher. The preacher's sermon is about avoiding temptation and not seeking out the devil, to put it simply. Avoid temptation, 
seeking to walk in the path of obedience so that we may never be guilty of tempting the devil to tempt us. The driver sees police lights off in the distance, just before we cut to them arriving at some kind of site. To the left, you'll notice, very quickly, a large piece of red construction equipment before the camera moves it out of frame. Possibly some type of red excavator. The person filming begins to walk through the mountains, and as they do, the camera seems to flash between what I think are two different points in time. The person who drove up here and someone else also recording the same area. The other perspective, not the driver, sees a trail of blood in the snow, or is possibly even the cause of the trail of blood in the snow. We cut back to the driver who sees something strange out in the woods, some type of figure, or maybe just a log that's being obscured by the darkness, but it looks creepy. As we keep cutting back and forth between the driver and the person who sees the blood trail, a distorted voice begins to play, an old newscast over the footage. The voice says, Two men were shocked and horrified when they came across what they at first believed to be a mangled carcass of an animal, but when the hikers witnessed a human skull, they hurried to contact the authorities. The word a human skull repeats two more times. It then continues, the two men, who wish to remain anonymous, say that they've hiked the Mount Greylock trails for over a decade, and while they've certainly seen their fair share of bizarre things over the years, they couldn't have possibly been prepared for what they witnessed that day. The man, who I assume to be the driver, approaches a tree, with a sign of some sort behind it. But before he sees whatever it is, we cut back to him in the car, seemingly having left. The fire and brimstone preacher continues, speaking that the devil will at times find us whether we want him to or not. Come face to face with the devil himself, whether we intended to or not, dear believer. We are drawn to him by our own hearts. As he speaks, the driver moves forward a bit and then stops, flashing their lights three times. Locally, where I live, there are a lot of rumors and urban legends about places where you can park your car and flash your lights three times. These places are usually a bridge or abandoned and considered haunted, and flashing your lights three times will cause something paranormal to happen, like seeing a ghost, or, in this case, what happens to the driver. As he flashes his lights three times, the fire and brimstone preacher says, You should make it easier on yourself and accept what it is that he bestows upon you. <laughs> We then cut to the driver, speeding down the road as the preacher, who is distorted and horrific now, ominously says that the devil There are a few things in this episode that are important, but won't make sense until later on in the series. The police lights, the construction equipment, and the knocks on the car are all rather important things. This also establishes the early idea of people seeking out bad things that they should not mess with, and the horrible reality that sometimes bad things will seek you out whether you want them to or not, as well as a very vague mention of the shadow or the darker part of the self. There is a shadow nested deep, deep within our hearts, within our minds, in a place most people don't even know exists within themselves. And also, who is driving the car? This is part one of an instructional video series from Hell. This tape has a lot of small important details, but for now we're going to try to hit all of the major points that it shows us. The tape in question was made by Unit 13, which is possibly the name of the lab that we saw in Episode 1. The project that this lab is conducting was part of a fictionalized version of Project Stargate. Part of the United States Army and Project Stargate, created in partnership with Simeodyne USA. Project Stargate was a real-life military unit and project conducted by the U.S. military to study the possible existence and military use of psychic abilities and the paranormal. Stargate is being worked on by both Simeodyne and the U.S. military in conjunction. The tape was made for a specific person, one Alexander Michael Marsh, and is primarily introducing us to the idea of tulpas or thought forms that Simeodyne and the U.S. military want to create. These are beings that are manifested of one's mental will, either purposefully or accidentally. They begin as an extension of a person's mental will, but as this tape says, they will eventually take on a sentience and physical being of their own, fully developing control of themselves. 
The tape offers us a lot of information, such as the fact that they can become full physical beings, that early thought forms are opaque and often confused as ghosts, and that all ghosts might be thought forms manifested by individuals' grief. We learn that Unit 13 is using a machine called the Thought Form Manifester to help create thought forms without years of mental training, as it usually takes people honing their mind and consciousness to be able to manifest them. The tape mentions that thought forms are kept in special chambers that they cannot escape from, and that the side effects of the Thought Form Manifester are incredibly mild, including such things as this list here. A second tape in the series is then mentioned at the end, called Waking Your Subconscious. Please enter the video cassette labeled TF2, Waking Your Subconscious, now. Which is coincidentally what tape 12 is called, which just came out recently. Now that we've finished the contents of the tapes, I want to talk about something that I think is interesting. Greylock as a series uses visual and audio corruption for emphasis. A lot of the times to emphasize something paranormal is happening, such as here in tape 3. This is very interesting to me because it establishes that in this world, the paranormal can affect technology, even things such as a tape where it is just mentioned. But it's also my little crackpot theory that sometimes the tapes do mess up when people lie as well, such as here at the end where it's used to emphasize the fact that the side effects are not as mild as they are said to be. This tape establishes a lot of ideas, characters, and themes that are central to Greylock as a series from this point on. Simeodyne is now established to be some sort of corporate entity that is working with the United States military to, in essence, create beings using people's deep, untapped mental power. The beings mentioned, known as tulpas, aka thought forms, are based on real-life religious beliefs and paranormal thinking. The origins of tulpas come from an interpretation of a Tibetan Buddhist idea by a Western religious philosophy known as theosophy. In Buddhism, there is a Sanskrit term known as Nirmanakaya. It's my understanding that they were meant to be a manifestation of an enlightened Buddha who would appear to the non-enlightened to guide them towards Nirvana, aka enlightenment. These manifestations of the Buddhas were incredibly varied, from real physical people to boats and mountains to visions that would appear to people. Every variation had a different name, but along with the umbrella term Nirmanakaya, they were also called Spiralpa in Tibetan. The Tulpa idea in Greylock is much closer to the popularized version that was created in the 20th century by a Western religious philosophy known as Theosophy. Thought forms in Theosophy could take on the form of those who create them, an object or person or something a bit less tangible such as an emotion or an aspect of the astral plane. Like here in Greylock, they were manifestation and extensions of people's consciousness. There is also an idea in Theosophy that a maintained thought form manifestation could be possessed by a spirit of nature or a dead person, which I find incredibly interesting. It also wasn't mentioned but once, and really won't be mentioned from this point on, but Project Stargate, again, was a real government thing where they were studying psychics. It's what Stranger Things is kind of based on, and essentially what Greylock is also based on. So you know that it's not good, especially when they're able to find something that actually does connect to us psychically. Having discussed all of that, just keep in mind that not everything is as it seems. And no, I don't purely mean that Simeodyne doesn't have good intentions. I think it's pretty obvious that they're bad. I just think Simeodyne has no clue what they're really dealing with, like most companies do in horror things. Just like the homeowners in this next tape. Tape 004. Unexpected visitors. Right off the bat, tape 4 is unsettling. We are watching someone film outside of someone else's house, late at night. We can see that there are people in the house, moving about, unaware of this person waiting outside. Also, there's this creepy looking cardboard cutout, which a comment said in the video is probably the creator as an easter egg, but only time will tell. Who knows, maybe this is the main antagonist of Greylock, truly. Anyway. It's easy to guess that whoever is filming the outside of this house is not a friend of those who live inside, nor do they live here or they would be inside, obviously. They break into the house with relative ease, finding a window unlocked. I'm guessing that people in this neighborhood are very trusting of their neighbors and unused to crime. They look up a dark staircase at a door. Suddenly the camera goes black and we hear the horrific screams of what sounds like a man and a woman being brutally attacked. After this, it seems that the same person is out wandering in the woods before turning the camera that they're holding up towards the moon. 
they zoom in, and then we immediately cut to an ad for the Max Headroom Show. I'd like to thank my producer, producer my writers. Right, right, right. Before this is interrupted by an emergency broadcast. Many counties in Massachusetts, including North Adams, Adams, Cheshire County, Northern Berkshire County, as well as Sigoy and Windsor, have experienced attacks on people's homes. 49 different residences have been broken into and attacked. Massachusetts State Police confirm the presence of a potential group of active and unidentified home invaders who have targeted 49 residences since approximately 11.15 p.m. last night. The attacks appear to be random, spanning across the towns of North Adams, Adams, Cheshire... After this, we cut back to footage of someone in their house. They're filming out the window, which is open, as they hear screams in the distance of people probably being attacked. They move to close their window, but just before they do, a hand grabs it and stops them. We see a flash of a monstrous, skeletal face on the screen just before a plain white mask also flashes on the screen. A horrific sound plays as we also see a flash of what looks to be a woman with half of her head missing. The video fades on these images. Another tape that just seems completely disconnected to everything else so far. What is happening? Something to note that will be very important for later, but does not seem so at this moment. The advertisement for the Max Headroom show is playing on ABC and says that the show will premiere tomorrow. The Max Headroom show in America premiered on March 31st, 1987. This is a very important tidbit for later. Tape 5 is centered on a woman visiting her obstetrician's office for an ultrasound imaging appointment of her unborn baby. She has a typical back and forth with the nurse, but in the middle of the imaging, something strange and horrific happens. Let's get some measurements to see exactly, exactly how much he's grown. For us, we see a flash of a newspaper article, which details the events of the previous tape, and then, again, that same expressionless, white, mask-like face is flashed on the screen. During all of this, we see a strange pattern on the screen, as well as hear a baby crying, and then... <gasps> what was that? I don't know. I've never seen that before. Maybe something to do with the power. When whatever is happening stops, the baby in her womb has just vanished. Like, it's just gone. The screen is black. Just. Gone. The woman, of course, begins to panic, and the nurse tries to calm her. Tries to go get another machine, saying that this one might be malfunctioning. H have this ever happened before? Um... Well, sometimes babies can move into certain positions that are hard to see. But... But, but you can't see my baby at all? But the doctor outside seems to stop and inform her of something grievous. The nurse can be heard even getting upset outside of the door. The woman begins to sob, and an article then appears on the screen, slowly zooming in. What are you talking about? No, 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 <laughs> Besides that date, March 31st, there isn't any actual information to tell us the year that this tape takes place. That actually comes in later tapes. And I've done my best not to spoil information we learn later, but I felt this was important. This event happened near or around the same time of the previous episode, based on the advertisement for the Max Headroom Show. And based on information that we'll get soon, it all but confirms that this event took place on March 31st, 1987, and that a lot of important events happened in this series in the year of 1987. Going back to the actual events of Tape 5, I wanted to bring up a theory that I saw in the comment section of the video, which is that the baby in her womb is actually a thought form and not a real child. I don't know if I agree with this at all. It's definitely a possibility consider what we're dealing with in this series, but later evidence will give credence to why I think this baby is not a tulpa. One reason I believe it isn't a tulpa is because the same white mask creature from tape 4 appears again when the child disappears. 
and that it seems that she carried the baby to term normally until this point, which is why I think it probably isn't a tulpa, but more than likely a child that was legitimately stolen from her by some paranormal horrific event. But that is just theory, we don't know for sure. What we do know is that Tiffany Crisaldi has taken her own life based on the obituary at the end of the tape. That her baby miraculously and horrifically disappeared from inside of her, and it was near the same day when the break-ins happened on tape 4. God, that's a lot of bad stuff. Hopefully the next tape has some good news in it. Tape 006. Sleeping dogs. There came a red flash as it pitched from heaven. Corruption wrought truth 0707. Tape 6 begins with a man named Dr. Bernard T. Hayes giving a speech at the North American Council of Thought in New York, 1981. You'll recognize Bernard's name as he is mentioned in Tape 3 as one of the overseers of Unit 13's Project Stargate. Named Dr. Bernard Hayes to oversee a number of the operations related to Unit 13's work. His speech is coincidentally on the manifestation of consciousness, which is essentially what a thought form is. Though of course his words take a dark turn as he speaks on standing eye to eye with that of God, as equals, which if you're a religious man is basically hubris. But also, most normal people don't love the idea of playing God that usually has terrible results. The tape distorts and we get what could be seen as the first attempt at an applause jump scare. More on that later. <laughs> Then cut to someone once again accessing the computer system of Simeodon. They bypass the system security and access the message logs of one Frank Porter, apparently a project director for, well, we really don't know what. Welcome to Simeodon USA's virtual message assistant for user. Project director, Frank Porter. Establishing custom telephone message setting. The message logs are specifically between Frank Porter and Paul Morelli. Frank hired Paul and his construction company to build the redacted facility. This facility could possibly be Unit 13, but we don't solidly know. The messages take place between March 24th and March 30th of 1987. Hmm, interesting. 1987 again. The first message comes on the morning of March 24th. Paul and his crew find deep tunnels in the mountains. There are carvings in these tunnels and signs that people have once been there. Both the tunnels and the carvings are very, very old. This shit looks ancient. Like real old. I took a crew in to look through it, but... These part of the tunnels caved in some time ago. We're gonna just have to bust through it regardless. But I still wanted to make you aware of it. Anyways, I'll keep you in. The message ends here. The next message is the morning of March 25th. Some of Paul's crew have mysteriously fallen with an illness. Unfortunately, a number of the crew are sick as dogs. Not uh, not really sure what kind of stomach bugs going around or what, but he decides to call in some men who'd usually have the day off. Even more mysteriously is that the caved-in tunnel was cleared and outfitted with lights, and no one knows how it happened. Wired up with a few lights too. Wanted to see if maybe you sent someone in while we were all shipped. The construction crew also reports seeing something out in the woods, like a strange, tall man skulking about. Something like a, a real tall man. Might just be some environmentalist moron trying to cause some shit, but... Him and his men are going to avoid the tunnels from that point on. Let's see how long he sticks to that. Message 3 is later the same day, around 5 p.m. Frank Porter sent a man to take photos of the tunnels, who was fine when he arrived, but became so sick that Paul's men had to carry him back to his car when he was done. Also, we found some really old shit down there, Frank. Now, I ain't no historian, but we got a guy on the crew who used to do archaeology work or whatever, and I don't know. But I guess there's some old artifacts down there, like weapons and trinkets and whatever. He says that he'll have Arnold Rivers, a former archaeologist that's on his team, write a report up for Frank to look over. Message 4 is the next day, on March 26th in the afternoon. The crew has just gotten sicker. Paul sees what his crew saw on the second day. I saw that thing the guys have been talking about last night, stalking around in the tree line. I swear it had a face. It's frightening because he feels the need to say that he swore that it had a face, which means that it either moved in a way or was shaped in such a way that having a face would be a spectacular detail, one important enough to mention, which is frightening. Message 5 is on the 27th, 10 minutes past noon. Paul and his crew find that all of their food has rotted, despite being fined the day before and stored properly. Our food looks like it's been left out in the heat for weeks. 
No idea what's going on. Please call me back. Message six is four hours later on the same day. They all see the thing again, Paul included. He says it was watching them, and they know that it's definitely not an animal now. It's watching us, goddammit. They put up trail cameras to try to catch sight of it. We see footage from one such trail camera, which detects motion, but we don't see anything on the camera. Message 7 has no real message, time or date. Just more trail cam footage. Footage of some type of fog or smoke passing by the camera in a very strange way. You can see that there's not much else there, no other fog or smoke, so what is that? Message 8, the 29th of March, two hours before midnight. A lot of the crew here are sick now and they're sort of like and unresponsive. None of their phones will call out to civilization, but for some reason Paul's phone keeps reaching Frank's messaging machine. Paul begins to laugh hysterically. He says that his skin feels tight. <laughs> my skin, it feels, feels tight. A lot of pressure behind my eyes. My, my teeth feel like they're, they're humming. He realizes that all of this started when they found that tunnel open, and for some reason, believes he needs to go back into it. That doing so will help him and his crew, and that if he doesn't, something terrible is going to happen. Little does he know that doing this is the terrible thing. He coughs, and says that going back into the tunnel is the only way, and then begins to ramble incoherently. We then cut to footage from another hunting cam, this time at exactly midnight on March 30th. Something seemingly camouflaged moves from in front of the camera. The footage cuts. The final message is received on March 30th, but has no marked time. I assume it's sometime after midnight though, and I'll explain why in a moment. We hear... Suddenly, Paul's deformed face comes into view of the camera as these sounds continue to play. The messaging system then cuts off. We cut to one more clip of that same trail camera. No date or time. A strange, white, mask-like face appears in the camera, one that we've seen glimpses of before. And then, the tape ends. This tape not only answers many questions, but is also a payoff to everything that has come before it so far. In tape 4, the break-ins are implied by the Max Headroom commercial to be happening early in the morning on March 30th. This is because the Max Headroom show on ABC premiered on March 31st after the show Moonlighting, and the commercial explicitly says, Tomorrow. This would line up perfectly with what seems to be the horrific transformation of the construction crew working up on the Greylock Mountains. I firmly believe that the men attacking people in tape 4 are these horrifically mutated construction workers. There also seems to be some type of connection to Tiffany Crisaldi and possibly other people's babies disappearing, but in what way we don't know. Besides the fact that the same white mask-like being appeared in tape 4 and 5 and was finally revealed fully in this tape. We also know that some type of construction-like vehicle featured early on in tape 2, which implies that whoever was filming in that episode went near to a construction site which could have been this one. So, tape 6, in my mind, is the inciting incident of the series so far, and establishes that there is something incredibly powerful up in the Greylock Mountain. The construction crew were affected by this power after traveling into the ancient tunnels, seemingly freeing whatever this white mask thing is in the process. After this, they were driven insane and transformed over a number of days, eventually attacking the towns around the mountain. This attack, as well as the disappearance of Tiffany Grisaldi's baby, are all connected by this white masked being. That is how everything connects so far. Tape 3 only loosely connects to things, but more will fall into place soon. Tape zero, zero, seven. Back to normal. We tune into a news show, specifically News 13, a live broadcast by anchor Don Wright swept across northern Berkshire County, left many of its residents in a state of anxiety and panic. It was two weeks ago when the emergency broadcast system was engaged to warn residents to secure their homes due to the activity of a group of individuals who had been targeting and breaking into people's homes. Analog horror series sure do love using counties. The police say that the attacks were done by an anti-American militia group operating out of western Massachusetts. The name of said group cuts out on the tape due to corruption. This is, of course, more than likely a cover-up. The police say the investigation is ongoing. 
The tape suddenly becomes more and more corrupted as the newscaster says that things are going to go back to normal. Back to normal. To normal. Back to normal. To normal. To normal. To normal. To normal. To normal. We hear some type of monstrous groan as the footage cuts to what seems to be video of conjoined twins crying. I find this very coincidental since this series has already established disappearing babies, but we don't have enough information to connect the two things right now, so this is just really creepy. Before the tape ends, we get a flash of two images appearing on the screen, for two single frames. One is an interview with a former police officer turned private investigator named Jim Melgren, who believes that something horrific and strange is happening in Greylock. He details reports of people becoming deformed, developing strange and sudden severe mental illnesses, as well as getting mysteriously sick in ways that doctors have never seen before. We then see a picture of Tiffany Crisaldi and Alexander Marsh, probably shown because of the strange and horrific event involving the disappearance of their unborn child. The two articles are obviously linked, probably from the same story. Just before the tape ends, we see the newscaster's face zoomed in and horrifically distorted, with damage to his mouth and eyes bloodied and sunken, with the word liar superimposed on screen near his face. Remember this face, it's going to be prophetic. This tape shows us that there is an attempted cover-up of the events happening in Greylock, the police purposefully covering up the attacks and attributing them to some random group that may or may not even exist. We also have the first mention of Jim Melgren, who will turn out to be a major player in the series going forward. We also get a shot of Tiffany and Alexander Marsh. The name of her fiancé looks familiar, doesn't it? It's because it is. Remember in tape 003? That tape was meant for Alexander Michael Marsh, who is, coincidentally, Tiffany Crisaldi's fiancé. Tape 3 was made in 1993. And Tape 5's events take place on March 31st, 1987, six years earlier. So with Tape 7, we officially know a lot of these important events happened in late March of 1987, around or at the same time of the Morelli Greylock incident. The news report itself is two weeks later, so about mid-April. We also got the tidbit that the man, Alex Marsh, mentioned in Tape 3, is engaged to Tiffany Crisaldi. Let's just hope that things are really going to go back to normal for residents of Berkshire County. And there's no loose ends to tie up. Tape zero, zero, eight. Old this tape starts with the ending of Tape 7. We then cut to a conversation between a GBS executive and two of the producers on The Don Wright Show. We quickly learn from their conversation that what we saw was broadcasted on live television. It also confirms to us that the television network is in on the cover-up. We also learn that the anchor, Don Wright, has been impossible to contact since he left after the broadcast, which I assume was just the previous night. Well, we've been trying to reach him. We've called him multiple times. We've tried his picture. We've asked around to see if anyone's heard from him. There's some real powerful people depending on us right now. They need us to manage the response to these events, to let the public know what's going on, and the last thing we need is it going wider than it already fucking has. So the executive tells the male producer to go check on Don whether he likes it or not. We then cut back to the Simeodyne computer system again. Interestingly, the file that was being accessed, the recording between the executive and the two producers, was deleted while the person was watching it. Sorry, the file you are trying to access has been destroyed and can no longer be executed or retrieved. And then, a new file appears out of nowhere. Warning, anomalous file detected. This file should not exist. Are you sure you wish to proceed? Opening file which is pretty amazing because it implies that the computer itself can recognize that the file is not right or is paranormal in some way. At least that's my interpretation. Whoever is using the computer decides to access the file. The computer reacts oddly to the file being accessed, the voice distorting before the file begins to play. About a quarter past nine at night. I was involved in the Morelli construction project at Mount Greylock. This would be about a week and a day after the home invasion attacks and a week after the disappearance of Tiffany Crisaldi's unborn baby. We quickly learn that this log is from Arnold, who was the archaeologist present at the construction site from tape 006. We got a guy on the crew who used to do archaeology work or whatever, and 
He can explain all this shit better than I could anyways. His name's Arnold Rivers. That's about it. It seems that he was hired directly by Paul Morelli. Why? I don't know. I'm guessing they were instructed that they might need someone like an archaeologist for their expertise. Which leads me to believe that Simeodine knew that something like this was up there in that mountain. Arnold records this log because he believes his life is in danger, and considering this is his final log, he was right. He goes on to detail that on March 24th, the crew found the tunnels. The very next day, Arnold says that Paul had the tunnel cleared, and sent him inside and a small crew to analyze the markings and any items within. On March 25th, Paul cleared the interior of the mountain and asked me, accompanied by a small crew, to look through the tunnels and record notes on what I was able to recognize. This statement is quite contrary to what Paul himself said in tape 6. I don't know how the hell this happened, but the section of the tunnel where I caved in is clear. The tunnel's been wired up with a few lights, too. Wanted to see if maybe you sent someone in while we were all shipped. My crew said you didn't, but you know, I didn't see anybody else either, so... Now this could mean one of three things. That Paul did indeed have the tunnel cleared, but him and the crew forgot that he did so, probably being affected by whatever sickness came from it. This would mean that he was being affected by the sickness much earlier than he thought, as early as the second day. The second possibility is that something taking the shape and form of Paul came and had the tunnel cleared, telling his crew to do so. I think this is the least likely because none of his crew remember doing this either. The third option is that whatever was in the mountain itself, or whatever creature is in the mountain, did this. This or the first are the most likely explanations in my opinion. As Arnold states in his log, that Paul did have the tunnels cleared, this leads me to believe that Paul either told them that he had it cleared just to not worry them, or he did have it cleared himself and forgot about it. Back to Arnold's logs. Arnold mentions that he was meant to directly report to Frank Porter, but at the time kept to himself what he found. He says that what they discovered was not normal. Not only because of the strange effect the tunnels was having on him and the crew, but also that what they found did not make historical sense. To keep it short, they found artifacts, writings, and more spanning all of written history and even before it. Some pre-Columbus, some ancient Chinese and Egyptian, and even earlier than that. This discovery would change human history as we know it. It was extraordinary enough to the point that Arnold believed it might have been a hoax set up for him, if not for the fact that as he checked the items, he could make out their authenticity himself. His excitement quickly turned to fear, though, as he realizes that something in that mountain must have been very powerful or important to be worshipped by so many different cultures across all of human history, even prehistory. I find that they alone would change world history as we know it today. I figured it had to be a hoax, but I'm confident that it's all authentic. But my excitement was soon replaced with a looming fear and anxiety. How could such a place be so important to so many cultures for so long? He at first questions the purpose of all of this as they go deeper into the tunnels, finding chambers full of baskets of spices, weapons, armor, religious artifacts, and more. It's when finding these that he comes to the conclusion All of it was there purposely as offerings. We cut to a TV bumper on News 13. This is a rather classic analog horror trope, but it does serve a purpose here. The segment explains how our moon came to be, a planet crashing to our own, becoming our moon, but also leaving fragments of itself within the Earth. This of course hints at the possibility of what might be in Mount Greylock, some part of this rogue planet that left something that horrifically mutates people or connects us to some alternate dimension or something like that, something that opens up our consciousness or some super fucked up alien being, but we'll talk more on that later. We then cut back to a police call from one Liam Hollander, the producer on the Don Wright show who was sent to check on him. We very quickly learn that Don is dead. Not only that, but whoever killed him, or whatever killed him, left his face exactly like it was edited on the hijacked broadcast. We then return to Arnold's final log. He sees many altars in the chambers deep within the mountain, and evidence of mass animal and human sacrifice. These chambers are covered with strange symbols and writing. I couldn't recognize a single familiar symbol, and it, it made me sick to even look at them. He states that while he's not a religious man, something of incredible importance is in that mountain. There's something in that mountain. S something people of countless cultures over the history of our planet have been worshipping, but I don't know why. 
and whatever it is spoke to him, made him feel as if he were in a fever dream, and even called him to go deeper. Since leaving those tunnels, he has not felt right since, hearing a constant droning noise in his own head. The recording implies that after leaving the tunnels on the 25th, he wrote up the report to Frank Porter, left the project, and recommended that they end it immediately. Frank calls him back on the 28th, of course wanting him to return the project, promising a full team, incredible pay, and the greatest historical finding in all of human history. I refuse again. I will not put a price on my sanity or my health, especially after seeing what was happening to the crew. This next section all but confirms the horrific things that we already knew about that construction crew. Whatever was in that mountain, whatever was in those tunnels, transformed them into horrific monsters. And Arnold's statements almost imply that this was happening as early as the day after the tunnel was opened, which was the 25th. Apparently, Paul's transformation was just the tip of the iceberg of the horrific mutations that these people faced. Arnold's log cuts to another Simeodyne internal file, logging the survivors of the Morelli Greylock event. It even says below that these are pre-classification, which I can only take to mean that Symbiodyne and the US government are planning on giving these different mutations different classification types, which would be interesting to see. To sum this section up, the construction crew, even this small sample of them, have been changed drastically. They've been mutated, they've had their minds changed, they've all become these horrific, inhuman monsters, some of them so different that to call them human would be doing a disservice to humanity. Some of them are comatose, but sit up and spit acid. Some are violent, monstrous, looking like werewolves. Others are literally just shells. Humans who seem dead, but when you get close to them, just get you sick and even spread some type of infection. There's even one who apparently can just convince you to do whatever he wants just by talking to you, which is terrifying, and obviously they say that they should euthanize it, because yeah. Patient possesses inhuman power of suggestion and influence over others. Do not interact. That's scary. That's a mon- look at that. Look at that. So yes, considering that, I guess I'd consider Arnold lucky, even with what's to come. Frank Porter accepts Arnold's resignation a little too easily. Arnold then goes on to recount the horrific events that happened after the Morelli mining incident, from the home invasions to apparently raining bodies in one county to the disappearance of people's babies. Arnold mentions he's partnered with an investigator and that he feels paranoid, finding his home unlocked at random times, checking his house for listening devices. He begins to calm himself down, thinking that he's over-worrying when something suddenly happens. His basement door opens and someone comes inside. Just talking about it. <gasps> this can't be. Oh my god, that's a basement door. Arnold hides in his bedroom closet and pleads for whoever finds this file and recordings to give it to Jim Melgren. <gasps> We've heard that name before. This is the second time Jim's name comes up, and soon we'll learn just how important he really is. Arnold stays hiding in the closet as whatever is in his house begins looking for him, making a variety of different disturbing noises. voice changing from that of a child to a grown woman to a man, changing pitch, becoming malformed sounding. <laughs> Come on out, it's the police! Arnold, of course, begs for mercy, knowing that whatever this is is not right, but finds none as the closet door flings open and the white, masked creature comes in, and it sounds like he is being torn apart before we hear a sickening squelch sound, and Arnold stops making noises. The creature then seemingly gloats, saying, And then the tape ends. 
This was a long one, and from this point on, most of the tapes are going to be pretty long. This episode gave us a lot more to chew on, especially following tape 6 and 7. This confirms the transformation of the construction crew and their horrific massacre. Based on the dates of capture on each subject, they were picked up only a few days after their spree of violence, which means during their attacks they might have still been somewhat human and just mutated more in captivity, but we don't know. Interestingly, Paul Morelli himself is not part of this captured group, but as it says at the start, this is only group C of however many. We also have a confirmation that the tunnels, the shrines, the statues, and everything are in the mountains. The pictures basically confirm it. I thought there was a possibility of them just being hallucinations, but the fact that there are images that can be in the video tells me that it's probably true. The short television segment also gives us a sprinkling of an idea of what's in the mountain. We can run with the theory that whatever is in the mountain was part of this rogue planet that formed our moon, lodging some part of itself in the mountain, some alien or paranatural thing that changes human beings and mutates them or allows them some deeper consciousness that creates these monstrosities. We also finally get to see the white mask creature in actual action. We know now that it can mimic people and it is violent. But this episode also added more complexity to it. Why did it kill Arnold? For what purpose? More than likely it wasn't sent by Simeodon. Whatever it is, it seems to have its own goals in mind. It seems intelligent. Intelligent enough to try to trick people by mimicking other people. Come on out, it's the police. <laughs> and even making fun of Arnold after killing him. We also know that it's connected to the break-ins as well as Mount Greylock as I said before. I don't think this thing is working with Simeodon as some think. It seems way too much like a chaotic force in and of itself, but only time will tell. There is a possibility that this thing is the main antagonist of the series, or at least connected to the main antagonist. That is, unless you also consider Simeodon one of the main antagonists like I do. Because if you can't tell, this episode confirms that Simeodyne is evil. They basically sent that construction crew up into the mountain knowing that something bad was up there and it was going to do something to them. And even as it did, they continued not to tell them and let them transform so they could test them, experiment on them, and see what happened to them. We also get that little tidbit that Don Wright was murdered, and we don't know who by, but whoever it was, was vindictive. They made his face look exactly like it was edited to during the hijacked broadcast. Was it that white masked being? Was it something else? Was it Simeodon? Probably not Simeodon. Whew, that was a lot, but wait, there's more. Tape zero zero nine. Trojan technology. While this tape is quite long, I think it can pretty easily be summed up. Simeodyne is pure evil. We start out with a broadcast from WRAV FM Radio on December 13th, 1963, which tells us about the National Access Initiative, a program to put technology into everyone's homes. This ranges from phones, televisions, and radios to smoke alarms, security systems, and more. The announcer says that the program is the creation of Lyndon B. Johnson in partnership with, you guessed it, Simeodyne, who will be providing the technology. This is already suspicious considering everything we know, but we very quickly learn that yes, not only is it suspicious, but it is in fact bad, very bad. The tape heavily implies that Simeodyne played a part in the assassination of Kennedy in this universe, not only showing newspaper articles about his death, but also having the CEO directly state this. Kennedy didn't go for it. He's gonna fucking expose our whole plan for the NAI program. After rejecting Operation Northwoods, and then that executive order involving the Federal Reserve, there are a lot of snakes in the grass. And it's about time that Kennedy got bit. We also see a lot of different shots within people's homes. I saw comments that thought that these were security cameras, but I do not think that's the case. A lot of these cameras are in really odd places, so I believe that the technology Simeodyne put in people's homes, from the phones, TVs, and cameras themselves to everything else, probably have cameras in them. It's all stuff that was put there by Simeodyne and the government just to spy on people. Apparently Kennedy was against it, but Lyndon B. Johnson was not. Asshole. So the CEO is as evil as he looks. I don't know if he's meant to look scary on purpose, or if it's just that the creator of Greylock used what looks to be a heavily edited AI image that just makes it look incredibly uncanny. I don't know, it just kind of looks that way. Simeodyne within the universe of Greylock seems to have created a lot of the modern technology that we use. 
and I'm wondering if we won't find out that their origins are also incredibly evil later down the line, like maybe they actually spawned from whatever is in the Greylock Mountains. Probably not, but who knows. I wouldn't be surprised if the CEO was actually like a 200 year old vampire. I mean, look at this dude, he's terrifying. The CEO talks about how important technology is and how it will connect us all. How America is really about security, connectivity, and accessibility. Only the beginning. We have so much more planned so that Americans can all truly be equal in our society. Security, connectivity, accessibility. It is our belief that it is these three factors that make America the best country in the world. This is rich coming from a guy who runs a company that turned a bunch of construction workers into the most evil version of the X-Men. Amidst all of the random shots of what seemed to be people's technology spying on them, we get a cut of someone aware that the NAI program was used to spy on people. Glad some people in the universe can pick up on what we can. Some of the imagery that we see from these different cameras is just incredibly disturbing. A lot of pictures of some very off-looking old people, and then this really disturbing scene of what looks to be someone who has ended their own life with rope and a closet door that slowly opens before we cut to the second applause jump scare in the entire series. And this one is actually something that got me and probably a lot of other people. It, it is truly a just a silly little jump scare. We then see a momentary clip of many people wearing white masks in the forest. This is the first time we're seeing what could be a cult at play, all adorning a white mask similar to that one monster that we've seen a bunch. This broadcast segment of the CEO ends, letting us know that basically everywhere and everyone is going to have semiodyne technology in their homes that is spying on them. From workplaces, schools, probably even bathrooms, to police stations, fire departments, my guess? The Greylock region was one of the first that got this technology, but that's only a guess. Next, we see one of Simeodyne's hidden cameras in a little girl's room on December 29th, 1994 at 3 a.m. And if that wasn't horrifying enough already, what happens next is surely going to put a shiver down your spine. A horrific skeleton flesh monster rises out of the darkness of the girl's room and begins speaking to her in this slow, raspy, horrific drawl. It implies that whatever it is comes from the device that Simeodyne used on her, possibly the same device we saw in tape 003. It for some reason convinces this little girl that it is her imaginary friend, and when it draws her close, it kills her. Like, what is the purpose of that? Why kill her? But more importantly, I think the skeleton monster is a reoccurring villain in this series. We've seen a similar creature before, and we will continue to see a similar creature from this point on. I know I've kind of harped on the idea that these aren't tulpas or thought forms, and that just might be what Simeodyne thinks they are. It's still a possibility that they are thought forms. It's just interesting that so many of them take on this same horrific skeleton flesh monster type form. I just think that's a little bit too coincidental that so many of them look that way, but that could just be whatever these monsters are when they possess a thought form. Moving on from what it might actually be, I think it's very interesting that the monster basically toys with the girl before killing her. It literally tries to convince her that it's her imaginary friend and gets her to come closer because it takes her glasses and then just kills her. And it seems to really enjoy just drawing out this whole process. It's horrifying. We of course also have that cult-like group that showed up for a minute wearing those white masks similar to that white mask monster. This is the only time that we see a definite picture of a cult-like group and we also see some cult-like symbology later but it's really hard to say that there is a cult definitely even with the 12th episode that's come out also it's fun remember i mentioned that it seems that the paranormal messes with the electronics you can see that any time in this episode that the skeleton monster says a sentence that is longer than a few words it starts to cause electrical interference with the hidden camera in the room and i just think that's really neat 
over here. Also, something a lot of people might not have noticed, but when the little girl is dying, we see a little flash on the screen of a woman with her head being pulled off or like tentacles coming out of it or something. This could mean a number of things. Could be wires, could be a representation of like consciousness flowing out of someone's head. The video ends with a recording of the Marsh residence on May 18th, 1987. Tiffany and Alexander lost their child on March 31st, 1987. So this would be a few months later. May 18th was a Monday. So this may be the day she died. This is all but confirmed in the next tape. Tape zero ten. Messages from the dead. A serpent right eye was plucked from his head and was transformed and engulfed in a great flame that was fashioned to provide light for all of creation. And lo, it was made to nourish the earth so that life might thrive and flourish from it. A man walks through the woods. He finds a dead rat. He picks it up and idly strokes it. We then cut to a recording from the previous tape. Alex Marsh calling Tiffany Crisaldi. She doesn't pick up. We then cut to him being interrogated by the police, talking about how she got worse and worse after the disappearance of their unborn child. On that day, she didn't pick up. Alex called again, pleading for her to call him back. We then see candles, some kind of ceremony, a droning noise. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on, but I'm going to head home. I'm sorry, I'm just I'm kind of freaking out. We then cut to what seems to be a recording of the computer of Dr. Heinrich Albrecht the medical examiner of Westfield. He is to be the conductor of Tiffany Crisaldi's autopsy. The date is May 19th, a day after her apparent death. The autopsy was requested by the Adams Police Department, and we very quickly learn why. She has a strange black tar-like substance leaking from most of the orifices in her head. There is no typical sign of violence or struggle to indicate what actually killed her. The most mysterious and unnerving thing is a carving that appears on the center of her body on her sternum. Symbol of some sort has been carved into the flesh. Equally concerning is the absence of hemorrhaging in the surrounding tissues. I've been able to ascertain that this symbol was carved into the skin post-mortem. In regards to timing, based on my analysis, I would say the cuts will likely be made several hours after death. This would of course mean that someone waited around with her body or came several hours after she died to put the carving into her body. The symbol itself is a strange star-like pattern with the top point missing, instead replaced by a line that goes all the way through the bottom as well. They have symbologists studying the symbol to see what it means. We then cut to what is probably one of the more disturbing parts of this tape. An unnamed doctor, whose face is censored with black bars, interviews a young Tiffany Crisaldi. She is six years old. This whole interaction is just incredibly creepy. The therapist is just really off-putting. But what he asks her is even more so. You're awfully quiet today. Are you seeing them again? Yes. Can you see them right now? Yes. Where are they? Where are they, Tiffany? And her response is as well. They're everywhere. What are they? Well, we don't know. Whatever they are, he can't see them and she sees a lot of them. We cut back to another log of the autopsist. Apparently, incredibly strange things happened after her body arrived. Electrical flickers and inexplicable drops and spikes in room temperature. The strangest, though, is that both the doctor and the nurse heard a woman crying. After placing Miss Crisaldi in storage and moving on to cleaning up, my sister Sarah mentioned that she'd heard what sounded like a woman crying coming from the direction of the cooler. I didn't dare to tell her that I heard it as well.
We return from this scene to Tiffany's therapy session. The doctor, in a rather threatening manner, tells her that they're about to conduct an exercise. He then says, I need you to follow my instructions, okay, Tiffany? As long as you do that, everything will be fine. Can you do that for me? Okay. Good. Which, yeah, I don't know. That just doesn't sound great to me. He then puts on a rather disturbing and distorted music track. Good. Now close your eyes. And keep them closed until I tell you to open them. What happens next is essentially the doctor putting Tiffany into some sort of trance. With her eyes closed, he instructs her through a very detailed mental walk through her home. This includes sensations such as physical touch, smells, and sounds. I imagine this is done to help connect with her subconscious, her home being a metaphorical place of safety within her own mind. Of course, this takes a twist when the doctor asks her, you walk into a room, and that's when you can see something different that's never been there before. Tell me what you see. It's... It's a door next to my window. That's right. It's a door. What does the door look like, Tiffany? It... It looks black. It has weird marks on it. The wood looks weird. On it are strange markings. Of course, this immediately takes my head to the symbol that was on her body during the autopsy. But this also recalls the strange markings that Arnold saw in the caverns of Mount Greylock. The doctor then insists that she open this black door. Walk to the door and open it. I'm scared. It doesn't matter if you're scared. You must open the door. Good job, Tiffany. Now tell me what's on the other side of the door. As this happens, we have visual corruption on the tape. This is, of course, the sign that something paranormal is happening. He tries to ask what's behind the door. She says, a small room. She insists that she sees a man inside. The doctor tries to tell her that she is alone, insisting that she ignore the man and tell him what the room looks like. This is where things begin to go awry. There's a TV. The screen is all fuzzy, and the tall man is watching it. Tiffany, I want you to focus on removing the man from your mind. When I snap my fingers, he will be gone. You will be alone. The man's shaking. His body is cracking. He begins okay, to Tiffany, react to this, shaking and cracking, and finally turning to look at her. It seems the doctor himself begins to become scared and tries to snap her out of this trance-like state. Whoever or whatever this man is turns to face her, and Tiffany asks, One, full control of your body. Zero, we're awake, Tiffany. You'll return to reality now. A quick flash of Tiffany's adult photo is shown, overlaid with the photo of her death. We then cut back to the man with the rat, who proceeds to cut it open. Inside the rat is a tape, which he then listens to. We see that same strange star symbol from before and hear a distorted voice. The person watching is Jim Melgren. The voice taunts him, insisting that everything will become apparent soon. The man seems to know a lot about Jim. This person contacting Jim only adds to my idea that there is a cult at play, but it could also be one of the monsters. It is funny to me the idea that one of the monsters is making a tape for Jim to listen to. Before the tape ends, we see one final scene, the autopsy room. Tiffany's container shakes, a horrific noise coming from inside, followed by the echoed screams of a woman. The horrific version of Tiffany's face can be seen. It suddenly flashes over the screen. The tape ends. This tape has a few big revelations for us, the main one being the realization of the character we've been following this whole time. This could be proven wrong down the line, but I feel there's a strong case that we're following Jim Melgren from the very beginning of the series. 
This would make a lot of sense, as he is a private investigator. Apparently he's very crafty, as whoever contacted him notes that he has done a lot to stay alive before. There's even more evidence of this to come, but I believe that Jim has been the character whose perspective we've been following from the beginning, all the way back in tape 1. This is interesting to me because that means there's an implication that Jim himself is in his 50s or 60s, which means he's one badass older dude. We also have the realization that Tiffany has had some kind of connection to the events of the series since she was a child in the 60s, seemingly seeing entities and even having an encounter with something inside of her own mind in one of these deep consciousness alternate world black door spaces. We also know that she wasn't as dead as we thought she was, or at least she's more alive than she should be. Whatever she's become, it's monstrous. I had another realization while editing that I wanted to add in post. You would think that I would get things like this on the first run through, but sometimes it takes a while for things to click, even if they're really apparent. Basically, there's an implication that Tiffany had some type of ritual performed on her, besides what was carved into her body alone. You also have the scene where Alex is calling her, and then it cuts to that ceremony with the candles. I feel like this almost implies that whatever cult might exist, if there is one, and I'm leaning towards there being one, I know I keep saying if, but we don't know, did something to her that carving, the candlelit ceremony, the droning, which is just, I think Alex is crying, drawn out to make this horrifying noise. I think something paranormal was done to her, some type of ceremony. Of course, we know about the fact that she's basically psychic and these experiments run, but I think something was done by like a cult or something. Anyway, to me, this only adds to my theory that whatever these monsters are, they aren't true tulpas or thought forms. Of course, as I mentioned much earlier, in theosophy, it is believed that tulpas slash thought forms could be possessed by spirits of the dead or even other types of spirits. But would a thought form still be purely a thought form if possessed by something malevolent? And also, even in Simeodyne's own tape, it says that thought forms are separate from the living entities that create them. So it wouldn't make sense that her body would become a thought form, which is why I think whatever this paranormal stuff is that's going on, it isn't purely tulpas or thought forms, as Simeodyne thinks they are, which is why I think Simeodyne is kind of misunderstanding what's going on here, but only time will tell. What we do know for now is that whatever creature Tiffany Crisaldi has become, it seems to still be connected to her body, or at least that's what it seems like at this point. But with that, we've got a boatload of other questions. What is the symbol? Who is contacting Jim? What brought Tiffany back to life? Is Tiffany a thought form, or is she something more or different? Who was the doctor conducting her trance? What is Simeodyne related to in any and all of this? Could this have been the moment that they found out about what's going on in Greylock, like when she was a kid, it's contacting this entity? We don't know, and honestly, the final two tapes we have so far still don't answer many of these questions, but they do set the stage for future events, and I'm very interested to see where they go. Tape 011. Preparations for a guest. What you so fear? So I am. This tape is short and sweet, and like the earliest tapes in the series, probably more of a setup that will make more sense with later information. We see someone setting up some type of trap in their basement. The video keeps cutting between this setup to a candlelit ceremony that we also saw a quick flash of in Trojan technology, though we still have no idea what that is. The person setting this strange trap places a tape player inside with a tape playing what sounds like someone moaning despondently on it, crying out for help. I believe that the person in this tape is more than likely Jim Melgren. He might have some other ways to ensure his safety because those boards don't look like they'd be nearly enough to trap any of the creatures we've seen in this series so far. If we remember back in tape 003, Simeodon had some type of chamber that they believe could keep the thought forms in place, so maybe he figured that out. There's also my crackpot theory that this could be Alexander Marsh. I only guess that because the video kind of implies that they're trying to capture Tiffany Crisaldi with the overlay of the candles and then also the tape sounding like something we'd heard in a tape with her before. We won't know until the future when we actually see this tape pay off. Which I will say this does sound like Alexander Marsh, it sounds like the voice actor who plays him and it sounds like he's begging for help, which is pretty worrisome. Speaking of Alexander Marsh... Tape zero 12. Waking your subconscious. 
You are now prepared to see new channels in your home. So, our long journey finally brings us here. This is the final tape that we've gotten so far, at least as of me recording this video. Remember that this very tape was mentioned all the way back in tape 3. Please enter the video cassette label TF2, waking your subconscious. Now, this is the end of this tape. Which was released almost a year ago to date. So I immediately want to point out something about this tape. Notice that the opening screen is different than the original tape we saw all the way back in 3. Now I can't be sure, but I thought this tape was more than likely made for Alex Marsh, as he was the subject of the first instructional tape we saw, which was tape 3. And it's quite obvious that Charlotte Melgren's name has been superimposed over other text with these black boxes. This isn't a sure thing, of course, but evidence later in this tape gives it more credence. This tape was created on the exact same day as tape 3 as well, January 2nd. I know I said this at the start, but I am about to repeat myself. I recommend watching this series on your own besides watching this video, because my explanation and breakdown will not do this episode justice. But again, if you need to watch this along with it, that's fine. This tape is a doozy. It is a lot of things. It's meant to be watched with a device known as the TF System Neurovisor while also writing in a workbook. It seems that the overall point of this tape is to restructure and physically change a human being's brain chemistry, allowing for a deeper connection between the conscious and subconscious mind. The implications of this become incredibly dark later. To do this, they play varying degrees of odd and terrifying imagery, which is on purpose because it says multiple times that being scared and anxious is great for mental conditioning. It's tremendously in your brain's ability to focus, but it also can make you feel vulnerable or frightened, which are beneficial to this program achieving the desired results. Section 1 is called Induction, which has a photosensitivity warning because it features a red flashing square on screen for a solid 30 seconds. I will now show that red square for a second so you can look away if you want to. And red square now! The second is Priming. Before discussing Priming, you'll probably notice the terrifying shadow in the background that is slowly growing closer and continues to do so throughout the video, so that's just fun. The priming section features a series of six words and finding one that doesn't fit with the other five. You can imagine that this goes wrong pretty quickly. The words chosen start out as mildly disturbing and then go from that to being just objectively horrifying. Eventually it becomes obvious that the tape is possessed or something is using it to directly contact Jim, who is obviously the one wearing the neurovisor. He's even on the damn poster for the episode. This is like one of the only tapes that has a poster. Flashing things like, all you cherish will be remade, and love contorts her flesh and bone, as even the words that seem to be part of the tape progressively get scarier and worse. Eventually, it speaks directly to Jim, asking, where's your precious daughter, Jim? Followed by a momentary flash of a missing persons poster of Jim Melgren's daughter, Charlotte. Now, remember at the start where it said Charlotte Melgren? Yeah, that didn't feel right, right? Well, we're going to get confirmation that that wasn't right. The words become very targeted, being about transformation and mutation, and then suddenly we see footage just for a moment of a camera being operated by Paul Morelli. This is another one of those things where I noticed this during editing and it just changes my perspective on a lot of things about this whole series. This clip is so short, but if you actually look, it says that the date of recording on the camera is 1997, October 3rd. That is 10 years after the original Greylock incident. And if this is Paul Morelli, this would imply that him going in the tunnels, that he almost time traveled or something like that, or that he is still alive or something. Like the camera pickup date is 10 years earlier after the initial Greylock incident. This does imply almost time travel or something or maybe I'm misseeing but that date just does not make sense it does not look like 1987 it looks like 1997 directly after this we get a warning that the tape being watched has been altered again like before with Arnold's message it seems that the technology is somehow aware that it is being changed in some way which is just incredibly interesting it even warns that the alterations may permanently damage people's psychology which is terrifying to say the least now we hit section 3, 
conditioning. This test is basically meant to overload one's perceptual senses. Emotions are flashed over faces, eventually incongruent with each other. This is a variation of a test called the Stroop test, which you've probably seen before. It's basically where like a color will be put over another color or a shape will be put over another shape and they'll be different. Like it'll say circle, but it's a triangle. You get what I'm saying. This of course takes a turn for the horrific as eventually every face just has the word scared overlaid it before the tape begins to corrupt. Then the face horrifically mutates. The word changed is shown as the face becomes like the meaty skull that we've seen before. We then cut to security camera footage. The date is 1992, just after midnight. Again, this is only more evidence that the tape was changed because why would there be surveillance camera footage of some random address on this tape that was made in 1993? We see a house comprised of two separate buildings. The two flashes that we saw earlier showed that Charlotte Melgren ran a kennel for stray dogs out of her home. So we can only assume that this is her home. We see that very terrifying skull monster once again as it enters the kennels run by Charlotte. Her dogs begin to bark. Her security system is obviously tripped by this. What happens next is undoubtedly some of the most terrifying moments in this series to this point, in the entirety of the series, really. Charlotte is awoken by a call from Troy Erickson, who works for the security company that monitors her building. She pleads that this must be a false alarm, that her father installed the system, and that the last few times there's been no real danger. This, of course, turns out to be untrue. But you guys have called me in the middle of the night, like, five times in the past couple of weeks and it's all turned out to be false alarms every time i i'm so sorry about that ma'am I, I i can take a look into why that might be happening if you'd like uh but first i need to be sure that you're in a safe situation troy is unable to see the footage for the current night so she convinces him to let her check on the kennel on her own without him calling the police oh um okay i'm getting an error it's not letting me review it well, I, I can just head over really quick. There's no motion alert in tonight's log, so... Okay, just please be quick and safe. Thank you. As she does this, he looks over the footage from the previous night and slowly realizes just how dire her situation really is. The previous alarms were not just false alarms, and he becomes scared and confused as he sees that skeletal monster prowling around her home for the previous week. Troy pleads for her to go back to her house, confused as to how any of the other security people did not notice this thing, and she relents, hearing the genuine worry in his voice. Everything seems fine. I'm, I'm really not sure this is a good idea, Ms. Mogren. So, listen, something's wrong with the recording as I'm seeing of your home. The previous calls you've been getting, they, they weren't false alarms. Uh, something's been stalking around your property for a while now. I, I'm not sure how the previous people who called you didn't notice. Okay, something like, what, an animal, or...? No, no, well, I, I don't know, actually. I just, listen, I, I just think you should go back to your house, okay? Please. Okay, okay, yeah, you, you win. Let me just make sure that the dogs are okay, and I'll head back over. They're just right here. <sighs> okay, thank you. But then, of course, this takes a horrific turn. The dogs are all standing perfectly still, almost statue-like. They're all just standing here. Well, it's late, so maybe they're just tired or something. Uh, but let's just get no, you back. not it. But they're just standing here, not moving. Like, at all. Like, not even their eyes. It, it's like... Oh my god. It, it's like they're fucking dead, oh, but they're fuck. not. What the fuck? What? What? As she finds this, Troy is finally able to see the current footage of the night. He watches as the skeletal creature enters the kennel not moments before she was woken up and the alarm was tripped, which caused him to call her. He panics, yelling that she needs to get the hell out of the kennel okay. now! Fuck. Fuck, I'm leaving! What was that? Are you okay? Charlotte! It, it just, it, it ripped my flashlight. Charlotte? It ripped my flashlight. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. Out of my hand. <laughs> Suddenly, something rips the flashlight from her hand. What follows is her, terrified, trying to find her way out. You need to try your best to be calm and just listen to me, okay? Can you find your way out? I'm trying. 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 I'm tr
door is fucking gone. The door is fucking gone. Charlotte says that the door is just gone, sounding absolutely terrified at this realization. Troy doesn't seem to believe her, thinking it is just her being panicked. But then he checks and sees this. Troy is shocked, but of course does not tell her, as this would kill any hope she has of escape. As she searches, we hear the creature in the background. It laughs and makes terrifying gurgling noises. Eventually, she enters a door and locks it, but it is not the door out. It goes somewhere else. Okay, very good, Trish. You're doing great. I need you to tell me what room you're in so I can inform the officer. Are you able to see now even just a little? Yeah, I can't, I, I can't see anything, no. It, it makes no sense. Nothing, nothing is making sense. I have no clue where I am. It's so dark. I, I can't tell if it's really this dark or if... Breathe, Charlotte. Breathe. You need to try and stay as calm as you possibly can. Listen, if it's that dark, whatever's in there probably can't see you either, okay? She isn't even aware of where she is, which almost implies that the door she entered should not have been there. He instructs her to stay quiet, and eventually we hear the monster sniffing around. It gets very close and then seemingly leaves. The call goes quiet. And then Charlotte says, I think my skin is moving. We hear her continue to scream as she's dragged off to God knows where. Well, we'll find out soon. We then cut back to the tape. Next, we have a series of questions, each more disturbing than the last and its implications. The tape is changing the viewer's brain. People will always fail their morals. Choice is an illusion. If you ignore the darkness inside of you, it gets worse. And lastly, Finally, we reach section five, activation. Before it starts, the ghost or whatever it is in the background appears close up, a flash on the screen, possibly possessing whoever it is, or something malevolent like that. What follows is a series of seemingly disparate but disturbing images and sounds, different tones, horrifying things, slowed words. This eventually ends with footage of a train entering the same tunnel over and over and over again. We cut back. This time to what seems to be the officer's body camera footage, which is, you know, pretty advanced for like the early 90s. He is at Charlotte's home looking for her. This is probably Officer Sergeant C. Wilkes, whose name appeared earlier on the tape. He searches their basement for her, smells something horrific, and eventually hears a strangled cry. The fuck was that? What he finds is, well, He runs. He runs after seeing the horrifically mutated Charlotte, seemingly combined with her dogs in a terrifying and painful mutation. It doesn't seem to chase him. I don't think it can. We cut back to the end of the tape. The next tape being TF3, The Shadow, Communion, and Assimilation. Well done on completing the TF2, waking your subconscious, video cassette. Once you have rested and you are ready, enter the cassette labeled TF3, The Shadow, Communion and Assimilation. This is the end of this tape. That is all we've gotten in the series so far. Collect the pieces. Make it whole. We've watched all the tapes together, and as we've done so, I've trickled in information that I've gathered, my thoughts and more, on everything that we've run through. Let's take a rundown on the different mysteries and more of how they connect. The first mysteries that the tapes give us are represented in the very first tape. What is this lab? Why are we here? And who is accessing these files? By tape 12, we've got an answer. 
Jim Melgren, the former police officer and current private investigator, is the one going through these files. The lab in question is, more than likely, Unit 13, somewhere up in Mount Greylock. This is seemingly sometime after the fall of Simeodyne, Unit 13, and Project Stargate. In the real world, Project Stargate ended in 1995 after being concluded as a failure. Seems in this alternate reality, it was successful in a horrific sense. Tape 12 is one of the only tapes to feature a poster, by the way, and it features a man wearing the neurovisor mentioned and seemingly having a bad time. Not only is this an incredibly cool image on its own, but it basically confirms that this is Jim Melgren, besides the fact that he is directly spoken to in Tape 12. Jim was apparently already investigating the strange things happening in Greylock before being contacted by Arnold Rivers, but I imagine being contacted by Arnold Rivers only deepened his want to get into this investigation. Besides that, it was also shown in that article way back in, I think, Tape 7, that he ran a radio show about government accountability and investigating, like, government conspiracies. He he obviously had a vested interest in all of this, and I imagine this desire to find out what was going on was only furthered when his daughter was attacked and, well, not killed, but worse. It seems that some of the major events in the series date back to as early as the 1960s, including the NAI program, Project Stargate itself, which started in 1978, and Tiffany's mysterious doctor's visits. It's pretty obvious to me that Tiffany was more than likely one of the test subjects of Project Stargate who happened to come in contact with this being within her mind. This is very Stranger Things, and it's even possible that this encounter that we experience in that tape is what would eventually lead to the many discoveries and events of the series in Greylock. The true inciting incident, though, of the series is the Morelli Greylock events. Everything is, in some way, connected to the Morelli Greylock event. The description of Tape 5 states, Do you know what they did up there? These are the consequences. So whatever that construction crew ran into, it just, it, it's everything. It's why everything is happening. Until we learn more about exactly what happened, I can only imagine they is Simeodyne and the US government using the construction crew as pawns to test and find out exactly what power or whatever is in the Greylock Mountain. Paul and his crew, or something, cleared that tunnel out. This, of course, leads to the break-ins, the horrific mutations, and seemingly the white mass creature being unleashed upon the world, which itself is involved in Tiffany's baby disappearing. There is a possibility that the US military doesn't know what Simeodyne is doing at that point, but I highly doubt it. We, of course, still don't know what's up there in the mountain. Whatever it is, it changed those men forever, from people into horrific monsters. This seemed to be the end goal all along, for Simeodyne at least, as the lab was still built in the area, to study what was going on up there. The language used to describe the beings was done by Simeodyne. I believe there isn't enough evidence to truly establish them as thought forms as they're talked about in Tape 3. To my mind, there are just too many variations of horrific things in this series. Now that's not to say that tulpas or thought forms aren't part of the series and don't exist within the world, but it seems to me that there is some greater horror that is connected to the overall human consciousness as well. Not just things projected out of it, but things that can also change us. Simeodyne and the US government obviously want to use these beings or whatever power is in the mountain for US military purposes. That's basically what Project Stargate was. There is a possibility that there's more at play, possible ulterior motives for Simeodyne, but we'll talk about that later. Besides the human horrors, we also have the monstrous entities. This is of course ignoring the humans who were obviously transformed by the power in the mountain. We have the white mask being and then the skeletal flesh creature that both show up multiple times, who I at least think are separate and not human mutations. The flesh creature can seemingly make exits and windows disappear, can possibly take you to another dimension, and can mutate you and combine you with other things as well. The white mask being can seemingly mimic almost any sound, moves around very fluidly, and possibly is just a disembodied face. These creatures seem to have their own goals, one being to just cause human suffering and enjoy it. Besides that, we don't know what these different entities want. Is there another party at play, like a cult? Is that who contacted Jim in Tape 10? I bring this up because some theories I've seen online think that the monsters killing people are working for Simeodyne, and I think that's unlikely. The only death that really makes sense is that of Arnold Rivers, and possibly Charlotte Milgren if Simeodyne knows Jim is investigating. Considering that the government is working with Simeodyne, they would have no reason to go and kill Don Wright, because he was disseminating their cover story for the Morelli-Greylock incident and the following attacks. This leads me to believe 
that these creatures or someone else are working against Simeodon, but not completely. That maybe they have their own goals, but want Simeodon to succeed in a sense. So what is up in the mountain anyway? Well, we have one momentary bumper that gives us an idea, and that's the thing that mentions the rogue planet that crashed into our planet and formed our moon. This, of course, insinuates that the rogue planet left something within our planet. Whatever it is, whether it be a being or some piece of technology or some magic rock, it is incredibly powerful. It allows for people to transform into monsters. It seemingly brings people back from the dead. More than likely, it taps into something deep within our minds that we don't usually have access to, and that's what Symbiodyne is trying to use to create weapons. As is mentioned in Tape 2 and Tape 12, within Greylock is the idea of the shadow. The shadow, to put it simply, is a term used in psychology to refer to the parts of oneself that we may not like, ignore, or even suppress. The shadow isn't necessarily bad, but it isn't good either. In Greylock, it seems that the shadow is a far more insidious thing. It is not only the darker part of us, but even insinuates that we all have some pretty extreme darkness deep within us. It's mentioned all the way back in Tape 2 by that Fire and Brimstone Preacher, and is elaborated on in Tape 12. It seems that whatever Simeodine and the government was doing involved unlocking some incredibly dark place in people's minds deep down inside of them. It also seems to be a way to prime people's mind for whatever is in the mountain. Whatever it is seems to capitalize on the darkness within people. Their fears and their anxieties. The difficult part is knowing whether whatever it is transforms them into some type of mutation or if it's something more paranormal. Are they in a sense possessed by something outside of themselves, or are they more literally warped by their own fears, anxieties, and bad habits into horrific, evolutionary, scared, monster things? With some specific language used throughout the series, as well as Tiffany Crisaldi's death and resurrection, I know which way I lean, but we're going to get to that in a moment. And yeah, I didn't really talk about it in this section, but Tiffany's resurrection seems like it's going to be important later. So far, it hasn't been touched on very much, but there's an implication of some type of ceremony that happened. She literally comes back from the dead, or possibly a thought form of her comes back and is just out and about. We don't really know yet. Now that we've laid it all out, here's the story of Greylock in my eyes. This could change with the future or even be wrong, so take any of this as more of a theory than a fact, me crafting the story as I believe it to be. Before humanity existed, a planet crashed into what we know today as Earth, and left something deep inside of it, in the mountain we know today as Mount Greylock. This thing that was left, whatever it is, is powerful. Whether it be being a flesh, or stone, or something more ethereal, something so foreign that it would be outside of human understanding, we don't know yet. But what we do know is that it has been worshipped secretly by almost every society that has ever existed. There's even a possibility that it made humanity what we are today, if we want to believe that it could somehow affect our evolution. It can change us, warp our minds and bodies, and even seemingly time itself. This thing, or being, is paranormal in our understanding, because it has abilities so far out of the realm of what we know to be normal and how the world to operate. It seems that in worshipping it, people made sacrifices to it, and maybe this appeased it for a time. Or maybe those ancient civilizations knew some way to contain it, some rituals, or some type of items. But as our technology grew, it seems that we forgot this thing, and forgot how to appease it or control it. Now we jump to the 20th century. A company known as Simeodyne has grown to titanic heights, becoming one of the biggest corporations in America and possibly the world, inventing a lot of the technology that we know today. How it got this large we do not know. There is of course the all too human idea of people conglomerating wealth and power to have more control, but with what we know about Greylock as a series, there's also the possibility that something far more nefarious is at play. That there's a connection between Simeodyne, that they had some type of information or even an artifact that helped them get to this point, maybe connecting them to that power in the mountain. Using the company's power and influence, the leaders of the company concoct a program to spy on all American citizens through free technology it promotes as beneficial to the public. They go so far as to have a hand in the assassination of one of our presidents to do this. Once the program, known as the National Access Initiative, is established, the government and Simeodon both collect information and use it to control people. 
Maybe they were looking for something specific in doing this. If so, they would eventually find it. Using this technology, they would find Americans with possible psychic abilities and do some type of experimentation on them, either starting in or prior to the 1960s. This would eventually lead to the fateful session between Tiffany Crisaldi and a doctor, where Tiffany would encounter a being within her own mind that seemed possibly separate from herself, or at least very powerful. I believe this event would lead to the discovery of whatever was up in the mountain by Simeodine and the US government. It seems that Tiffany Crisaldi has a much bigger involvement in the plot so far than we understand, both as a young person and an older person. She may have had her memory erased, or even forgot those tragic events as a coping mechanism. We don't know at this point. Eventually, Simeodine and the US government would find what they were looking for. Up in Mount Greylock, whatever had been left there was calling out to people with psychic abilities that they were experimenting on. Through whatever experiences they had with this thing, they decided to do a horrific experiment believing it to be dangerous, and sent an innocent construction crew into the mountain to clear it out without any warning of what they were going to encounter. The construction crew cleared the tunnel and were instantly affected by the magnificent and horrific power of whatever is in Mount Greylock. They freed the white masked being also, who seemingly had been trapped inside the mountain with whatever else is in there. The men progressively got ill and changed, Arnold Rivers took off of the project early upon seeing this and everything else within the mountain. Simeodine and the government ignored the men's calls for help, and eventually the men would heed the call of whatever was inside the mountain tunnels, and would become permanently changed by it. Horrific mutations, looking as if they'd once been human, but it was quite obvious that they were not human anymore. This single event would have a domino effect. This would lead to the men descending from the mountain in their monstrous states, attacking anyone they encountered as their minds had been just as twisted as the rest of their bodies. This was in part driven by the white masked being, who we would see flashed on the screen, though the white masked being also played a part in the disappearance of Tiffany Crisaldi and Alexander Marsh's unborn child, and maybe a few others, as well as raining bodies down on local towns and possibly mutating other people in the Greylock area. It's possible that Tiffany's baby was affected by the experiments, or even the connection to the power in the mountain that she established in some way. Or it's also possible that this white masked being took her baby as a form of sacrifice. The events caused by the Morelli Greylog incident would become massive news in the area. Tiffany and Alex's story would be covered, and a private investigator would become interested in these events. His name is Jim Melgren. He began to investigate what was going on, believing that it was connected to the government in some way. He'd be contacted by Arnold Rivers, who'd tell him that he had information that would prove this to be true. As all this was going on, Simeodon would round up the mutated construction workers that they could find and contain them for study. Their mutations were so drastic and various as to make some of these former humans extreme hazards to life by just being in the same room as them. Arnold Rivers would become paranoid, feeling as if he was being followed and record his interaction with the events of the story. During this recording, he would be killed by the white masked being, possibly before he could share his information with Jim Melgren. With the loss of her baby, Tiffany Crisaldi would seemingly take her own life after months of depression. But we know this to be far more complicated than the initial story. Tiffany's death didn't seem to be actually suicide, but there were no signs of a murder. A strange black substance oozed from the orifices in her head, and a symbol had been carved into her sternum. The optocyst experienced strange paranormal phenomena during his examination, and after leaving, it seemed that Tiffany had come back from the dead, though in a state that was far less than human. This could be because of some type of ceremony or ritual that was done to her before her death or even after, or even a result of the experiments done by Simeodine and the government. Only time will tell. Simeodine and the government went on to build a lab somewhere in the Greylock area anyway, and began experimenting with this power in the mountain. They built devices, either using something within the mountain or harnessing its energies, to try and create what they said are thought forms to use as weapons. This would be part of Project Stargate, which was a project by the government to use psychic abilities for military purposes. To me though, these beings are not thought forms. It seems to me as more of a connection to something else. Maybe this allows horrific beings from another world into our world through our minds, as separate beings or even in our own bodies that might possess us. That would be what the shadow entity is inside of us, and why it's almost referred to as a separate thing. Or it really could just be some dark part of our DNA or consciousness that is unlocked and allowed to change us whenever we encounter this power in the mountain. Or it really could be th tulpas and thought forms that are just evil. 
These experiments would eventually require new people to join the program to be experimented on. This would lead to Alex Marsh applying and a young girl named Katie, who would eventually be murdered by this skeleton flesh creature. Jim Melgren during this time would continue his investigation, unaware that his involvement may have caused the death of Arnold Rivers, and unaware that it would lead to the horrific transformation of his very own daughter. Scared for her safety, Jim would have a security system installed in her home, but that did little to protect her as these horrific beings are far more powerful than he may have understood. Charlotte would become trapped and taken, merged with the dogs that she loved into a horrific chimeric abomination. After this, she would disappear. It was possible that Jim didn't even know what had happened to her until seeing it on these videos. Did Simeodine and the government take her, or did the monsters retrieve her after showing that cop? Eventually, events would happen that would lead to the lab of Simeodine and the US government being shut down. Maybe marked too dangerous by the government. Maybe something worse happened, something far bigger, an event that we are heading towards in this series, but have yet to reach. Any number of things could be going on, but we don't know yet. What we do know is that all of this information has been told to us because Jim Melgren is in that lab, Unit 13. He's been going through these files. He's being contacted by someone, even seemingly trying to catch these entities. Jim puts his own life and health at risk. He watches these tapes despite them seemingly changing him. He puts on the Neurovisor. Through this, he learns about the horrific events that led to the death of Arnold and the transformation of those men in the construction crew and his own daughter. He also learns about the death and resurrection of Tiffany Crisaldi. Jim is trying to figure out the truth, but what is the question? The question is, what happened and why? What is up in the mountain? I think it's something that connects to our minds. It opens them up in a sense, like a portal or a black door, and allows things from some other place, some other dimension, into our world. They can possess us or even take their own physical form or do any number of things. These things were proliferated because Simeodine and the US government believed that they could control them and that they were created by us, or maybe even that they were fooled into believing that. And as the events played out, maybe even a cult formed around them at some point. This cult, or maybe even a mutant with some personhood, is who has been contacting Jim, who did the ceremony on Tiffany Crisaldi, and is one of the other players that we have yet to fully encounter in this series, besides in vague, mysterious ways. So what's next? Well, it seems Jim or someone is trying to catch one of these monstrosities, with a tape that sounds like the tortured cries of Alex Marsh, as gruesome as that is to say. I think we may know more when we see how this all plays out. That, in my opinion, is the story of Greylock so far uncovered. There are little details that I think are very interesting that we'd eventually figure out. One little crackpot theory I have is that the flesh skeleton monster might be Paul Morelli. And we also know, or it is possibly hinted at if it's not a mistake, that there is time travel also in this series, since there's that tape where it says that the date on the camera is like 10 years later, but the camera was recovered in 1987. I'm really interested in how that's going to play out. It does seem to establish that Paul Morelli was alive and took a camera down into the mountain, either during the Morelli Greylock incident or something else, and I'm really interested to see how that plays out, but I don't know how it could fit into all this theorization that I have. As I said, there is also the possibility of a cult or another sentient being at play, whoever's contacting Jim. The fact that I don't think Simeodine is possibly doing all of this, they really do think they can control these things, and something else is like manipulating them, I really do think that's a big possibility in this series. Um, that doesn't mean that Simeodine is good, because they obviously want to use these thought forms or whatever these beings are as weapons to fight against other countries, probably Russia, because this takes place during the Cold War. And yeah, it seems that the events all take place after everything has happened. Jim Melgren is investigating things. That means more things can happen, but I feel like we're going to discover some big event. Maybe the whole Greylock region is like a dead zone, and you're not supposed to go there because it's full of these monsters. Or maybe the end of the world even happened, and we're seeing something after that. And whoever's contacting Jim, that's like a big deal. But I don't think so. I think probably society is still up and around and bad things are just happening because I think maybe tape 2 and tape 12 and a bunch of the ones that take place, air quotes, in the present are all taking place around the same time in the mid to late 90s. But that's just my opinion. So, that's it. That's the story of Greylock so far. 
It was a lot, and I know I didn't really give any definite answers, but I think we were just scratching the surface as to what's going on. There's more to come, more than likely. I feel like Rob Gavigan has a lot planned. Like I said early on in the video, it really does feel like he probably wrote all of this out and is just coming up with interesting ways to share the information with us. But we won't know until more parts happen. It was pretty hard for me to theorycraft because as I said, every time a question is answered in this series, a new one or two new ones are posed. And I feel like a lot of things, especially early on, are red herrings. This specifically in reference to the thought form and Tulpa's thing, but that's just my gut feeling, and I could be completely wrong about that down the line. I do love the idea of horrific things being let into our world from some other plane through our consciousness, and it seems like that might be where the series is going. And before we wrap things up, I want to talk about some of the ways that I think Greylock is effective horror, and the way the series does what it does. As you can tell, a lot of the things are laid out in the series from the very beginning. Questions that are posed all the way in tape one are seemingly answered much later, like the fact that our main character is Jim Melgren. And that's like a super early question that doesn't get answered until like tape eight or nine really, or even the more recent ones if you want like concrete evidence. We also see that construction equipment in tape two, and we learn about the Morelli construction incident in tape six, which all connects us to tape four with the, the break-ins and then the disappearance of Tiffany's baby as all the dates line up and the emergency broadcasts. The, the fact that the Max Headroom commercial is one of the things that is like an early indicator that different events is connected is just crazy. That's such a small little tidbit. The creator of Greylock, Rob Gavigan, has this incredible knack for leaving the tiniest of breadcrumbs like that Max Headroom commercial to connect different parts before giving you like a big like, oh, here is the obvious evidence. Not only that, but the horror in the series is there like right from the start along with that. I believe I've complained about this before, but a lot of modern horror movies have a problem of being like 90% build up. This is especially a problem with found footage films. Something that analog horror in general is really good about, but especially Greylock, is that it's basically scary from the second tape. Not like shaking in my boots scary, but I had a few times while watching these tapes late at nights and taking notes that I was looking over my shoulders because of the scary visuals and sounds. The author and the editors and everyone working on this have done an incredible job at doing this horrific uncanny valley imagery and these soundscapes that just really get into your spine and leave a little tingle. It's, it's both subtle and it isn't. I was watching a Meat Canyon live stream recently and he talked about wanting a found footage film where it starts in the middle of stuff going on and that's basically analog horror but especially Greylock. I imagine it might have been different if you followed it from the start having to watch like tape one and two and just not really much going on and you being really confused but as someone who binged the entire series one through twelve and like a, a week over and over again I'd say that it was all pretty effective and it's roughly movie length a constant drip feed of scares in each episode and information constantly being used to build up this story you do have to pay attention though that is something else it seems like Rob as I said earlier, has had this story planned out from the very beginning. Just based on the series and the way it's been crafted, it almost feels like he has written out the entire story in like a novel or like a big piece of paper, and he's just picking bits out and like sprinkling them in and thinking of creative ways to feed us that information. Like, we're picking up logs in a video game and piecing it together um, in a place long after the events occurred. I love that kind of stuff in games, and I just think it's really fun that we get a visual medium, like, like almost like a show, like this, because it becomes almost game-like. Yes, you're watching something, but you're also like taking notes and playing along. Having said all of that, I do have criticisms. Greylock is great for its horror and storytelling, but in the same way that it succeeds over found footage films, I also feel like it has a disconnect that found footage films usually have the opposite problem of. This isn't really a story about characters. We do have characters, and a lot of bad things happen to them, but we don't really become attached to them. Like, yes, it is sad when something bad happens to a character, but it does take a long time to fully establish and really get to know a character in a series like Greylock. And I do think as the series goes on, Greylock is getting better about it. It's just the way that a series like Greylock, which is in analog horror, does it is so disconnected that for a minute it's just like you're more horrified about what's happening than the fact that the horrors are happening to these specific people. And I do think that's a greater problem with analog horror than just Greylock. 
Besides that, I think the sound design and the visual design in this series are great. I'm not a fan of the AI imagery that seems to be used at times, but so much of the individual art that is used throughout the series is so good that I find it very forgivable. I think some of what holds back Greylock is the fact that it's analog horror, when it is really exceptional when it does break that mold. I do look forward to seeing Greylock as a series progress, and the future of analog horror in general as they deal with this balance of the unusual storytelling methods of like direct information, audio logs, and data files mixed in with the traditional live film segments and things like that. I think that having that balance is good, and having those logs build up to these live action segments makes them more impactful, and I would like to see a bit more of that balance. I think the reason so many people like Tape 12 is it has this long security camera footage part and the ending with Charlotte Melgren that really is impactful when you're just lining it up with all the other information that's been set up so far. Of course, I'm no analog horror expert. This is probably the second or third series I've really watched all the way through on my own. The only criticisms I have for analog horror series, and this includes Greylock, is kind of a broad stroke criticism. I think it's hard for people who aren't already invested in analog horror to get into analog horror because of how different the stories are being told and how interactive the series really is. You really have to, like, think about what's going on and take notes, and audience participation is such a big part of it. It's almost like you're watching a puzzle with a bunch of other people and trying to connect it all together as a group. I personally have always loved that kind of stuff, so I think Analog Horror was perfect for me. Like when I was a kid, two of my favorite movies were Memento and LA Confidential, because, you know, I was a weird kid. I think it would be hard to get someone like my mom or dad into a series like Greylock because of that. It'd really take a lot of your attention to get what's going on past the horror and kind of put the story together. And like I said, that's more of a criticism of analog horror in general than just Greylock. I've put on some analog horror series at my mom's house just to see how she'd react to them, and she liked the vibes of them, but she had no clue what was going on. And no, I'm not making this a young versus old thing. If I've learned anything from having a YouTube channel and it growing, it's that people of all ages watch YouTube and love these type of creations. What I am saying is that different kinds of people are used to different kinds of media and ways of storytelling. And that analog horror is a non-traditional video format, and that a lot of people would have trouble sinking their teeth into it. Kind of like when you get someone who's never really played video games to try and play video games, and it's like, oh, it's second nature to you, but when they pick up a controller, it's almost like they're learning to walk for the first time. And a lot of people just don't want to deal with that. Because of the non-traditional nature of Greylock and a lot of analog horror, it's hard to pick apart internet video like it with the framework that I was taught in like film school. I studied film for like three years in college and then dropped out. Uh, part of the reason it's hard to analyze is because I dropped out 10 years ago, and so I've forgotten a lot of things. But another part is that Greylock as a series does not function like a typical film. There are a lot of outlayers that we were taught in college, as in, like, this is not a typical film, but more what they were teaching us about was how different films did narrative, rather than, like, strange camera work or strange way of delivering the narrative. And, and there were some examples of that, but, like, we didn't get crazy stuff like this. And in that sense, it's hard to even compare Greylock to a TV show or a movie, because it's just so different. It is such a different thing. There are, of course, parts that can be analyzed normally, but this is going to be most of the found footage format, and it would just be like, oh, it's very interesting that they use this live-action format, but the framing is meant to look like a normal camera. So besides that, it's just, you know, you'd just be going, oh, this looks good or this looks bad. The thing that you can analyze normally in Greylock and a lot of analog horror is the narrative and what you're trying to figure out. It's part of the structure of the film that is Greylock just as much as the visual representation. I do love the way that the creator, Rob Gavigan, does things, like how sometimes on-screen errors denote something paranormal happening or someone lying, 
I like the balancing act between live action and pure informational storytelling. It really does make it feel like you're sifting through case files and finding the occasional little gem of video that gives you even more evidence. So much of analog horror really is just soundscapes. Yes, there are visuals, and the visuals are scary, but so much of analog horror is just the sound. And that's another thing about movies, is that sound is really important. And it's one of the reasons why I think analog horror is so cool, because it's like 60% sound. And so you really have to nail the basics of having a fantastic film-like soundscape while not really having the visuals of it. And I think that's really cool and shows a really unique skill set. And I think a big part of what makes analog horror cool and feel real is that it isn't just a third person narrative thing. It's, you're not some omniscient camera following people. You do feel like you're looking at a historical record and it kind of keeps you in the story to a degree. It makes you feel like you're part of an investigation of these events. And I think with analog horror, the feeling is just as important as everything else. Greylock is analog horror and analog horror is Greylock. If a movie were made about the story in Greylock that has been told so far, it would be so vastly different as to be an entirely different piece of media that would be appreciated in a different way. I think part of what people love about analog horror is how different it is. It's an audiovisual experience and a detective game and a horror movie and a audience participation group study and so many other things. Some people are not going to get it. And not in that exclusive way where you're like, huh, you're not going to get it. Just be, some people won't like it, and that's okay. The people who do like it, like it together, and that's cool. Sometimes I don't even think I entirely get it. But when I do, and for the people who do get it and love it, it just really scratches an itch. It's scary, it's fun, it's got this audience participation. In every comment section, people are theorizing and talking to each other and just sharing things. The subreddits are just people constantly throwing theories and going, oh, that's, that's interesting. And it's just really... Anyway, if you really enjoyed this, please check out the long-form analysis playlist on the left. It's got the analysis of The Oldest Few, and also Kane Pixel's The Backroom series, and more to come. And on the right is going to be my last video, which is about an 8-bit horror game that you probably haven't heard of, and is really silly and interesting. So, anyway, I'm Ghost on Holiday, and remember...